we got one of the best in the business with you today. You're going to get a lot of information on how to get your room correct. Really vital stuff. You know where you're at. This week's Pensado's Place. Yeah. Man, I'm really excited today, uh, Wingman Herb. <laughs> that's what that's what you call an ad lib. Uh, uh, what's that foghorn leghorn commercial? That, that, I say, I, I say, son, that's what you call an ad lib. You know that? And the guy walks out. And that's pretty good. We've though. already made contingency plans for Herb to hit me very hard. Man, thanks for watching. Uh, I was checking the, the the Facebook on my way in today to make sure I. I um, got a feel for your questions and everything and it seems like you guys are excited as I am to have uh, Bob Hodes on the show today. Um, I've known Bob for, wow, 15 or 16 or 17, 18 years. The best in the business, no one can, can, can give us better information on probably I think the single most important part of a home studio. Um, I see you got your notes ready. to. Uh, yep. um, Shall we do a, a little bit of homework? There's a rumor that he invented the twizzle flanger, so we might we Ooh. might check that out. Could be a copyright fight. I think so. <laughs> we'll we'll address that on the show in the future. <laughs> in the interim, guys, uh, as as Dave said, let's make sure you get our information to us. Facebook is so helpful. Um, we'll flash up on the screen all the information as usual. Our Twitter handle at Pensados Place. Our email uh, Pensados Place at thisweekend.com. You know, we have our YouTube page and our Facebook channel. Your comments are most helpful. We enjoy reading them. We take a lot from them. So make sure you get there. Our chat room is full. And obviously, manning our chat room is the one, the only, Drew Adams. Yeah. What's up, people? Yeah. Yeah. Where's my microphone? Yeah. And that's Dave on sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Your engineering from. Oh, well, uh, you heard that little extra 2K I gave. Incredible. The headroom was, was well, amazing. I did, I did it an acoustic way with cupping, but Bob's going to explain how Fantastic. All that works. Fantastic. Yeah, right. Fantastic. Compression's important. Yeah. And <laughs> clearly, this room has not been done yet. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, on to uh, what should be a really helpful show for our, for our audience. Is that a cue for me to do something? That is. <laughs> to talk to our guest. I got a couple things on my mind, Herb. Oh, okay. No. <laughs> that would be new. First of all, I don't know if you guys were watching TMZ yesterday, but Zan's back in California. So round of applause out there for Zan. Hey, uh, Will, train the new guys how to applaud and make noise. Uh, Zan's back in, in, in town. We'll, we'll be talking to him soon. And uh, I, got a, I got a message from Joe. And Joe is an engineer in Chicago. Joe, I heard you loud and clear. Um, I'm going to say a generic answer because a lot of you guys seem to be basing your hopes and dreams on the possibility of working with me. Um, you're going to have to fight Drew for that position, and Drew's a badass. So I got, I got my guy Drew. He helps me. There's no positions available right now, and there probably won't be in the future. But uh, when you watch the episode where we had the three assistants on, including Drew and Jesus and um, Chris, uh, it's a process, guys, and, 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 and you're making me feel bad because I really want to really help you and, and, and everything, but I really feel in my heart you're better off finding any place to work and, and learn yourself, teach yourself, and then once you get to a certain level, you're going you're, you're gonna to be way ahead of what I could teach you anyway and probably a little bit faster. I think I actually retard the growth of my assistants because I... I, 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 I pack their little heads full of so many things. I think I can, they leave me confused. If you notice, uh, only Jason, I think, hit the ground running after me. And uh, most of the guys have to go through psychiatric treatment for about a year to get back <laughs> into the business. But um, anyway, on a positive note, the only reason I bring that up is because I get that question a lot, and it's something that kind of hurts me that I can't um, have a control room of 500 assistants or Recently, I'd have to have, I'd have to have a, a thousand assistants in the control room at a time to accommodate everybody, and I'm not being flippant. I just I just want you guys to know that it's 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 not going to happen. But watch the show. The same BS that I I, I tell my assistants, Drew. I, I'm not I'm not lying. The same crap I say hour by hour 
when we're in, when we're working together, yeah. they can get in 30 minutes on the show and not have to deal with that, right? Am I lying? No, I mean, I know the audience appreciates the show. Like, they hit me up constantly at Facebook, and like, I even working on the show, I appreciate everything that goes on at this table because nobody's done this before. Mm -hmm. So, I just want to say, while you're giving me praise and everybody else praise and thanks and everything, thank you, Herb. Bob, all our guests, and everybody, like, this show is special. And you guys all know it, and that's all I got to say. All right, Get back man. to the day. Thanks, Drew. You didn't yeah. answer my question, but thanks. <laughs> all right. So. That's what I learned from you. <laughs> <laughs> man, I went, uh, I went Larry King on it for a second. I, I, I don't, in case you don't know, Herb and I went to the Larry King Institute for um, how to host your own TV show, so a lot of my techniques might remind you of that. Herb didn't graduate, so you can kind of tell he's a little better than I am. <laughs> How many Matt, what the hell's going on? Matt's trying to get camera time, man. That's cool. Matt's cool. Let's get to Bob. Bob, man, thank you so yeah. much for being here. Guys, Bob Hodas is the premier, um, I can't say this word, a acoustician? Is, is there such <laughs> a word? You can call me a room tuner. I didn't want to do that, but yeah. well, yeah, say it, Herb. You're the genius. I, I, okay. Acoustician. Acoust, acoust, Ready? Uh -huh. Room tuner. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Herb. You're welcome, uh, Bob. Thanks. My pleasure. Nobody, nobody does it better than Bob, and I'll tell you why. And we're gonna, we're gonna understand this is in a minute. Um, it, it's, it's part science, but to do it correctly, there's a huge art component to what he does. The, the machines, Bob's got the best technical equipment, the most up-to-date stuff. I think he's got 30 physics degrees from, from all the accredited universities. And at the end of the day, it basically comes down to his taste. Uh, every time I go to a new room, like we went to the Palms recently, Bob goes in ahead of me and he tunes it and I walk in and it's just it's spectacular. It feels like I'm at home or if I go to, um, um, Glenwood Place or Record Plant or whatever, and then my room at Larrabee Studio 3 there, uh, I think that's the best sounding control room in the world. We'll verify that with Bob. And Bob, Bob has that room, I mean, I don't know if you understand, but the lowest frequency that you can possibly get is a battery, zero, <laughs> zero frequency. And Bob's got that room tuned flat to batteries. I mean, it's like you can hear half cycle tones in that room. It's it's incredible. So without too much more further ado, all right, guys, it's been fun. Great, glad you could watch the show. We're out of time. Bob Hodas, thanks for being here, my friend. Dave, it's a pleasure, man. Thanks, thanks for inviting me. Uh, Bob's tuned Prince's rooms. Uh, you're, 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 is it okay to talk about the? Not who it is, but or where it is, but that room that you're working on is like, what do you say, four million dollars? No, no, it's a, it's a home theater that's a million dollars. A million dollars? Yeah, a million dollar home theater. Actually, there's two of them for a guy up in uh, How can up Herb in Canada. afford that? Herb? <laughs> Stays, Stays yeah, humor. Oh, oh, You'll get yeah. used to it. <laughs> You'll get used to it. Stays, uh, you just kind of roll uh, with it. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah. I, I mean, I can't m mention any names. You know, no, I, sh I should, I should say though that I'm, I'm the prince. I shouldn't take cl claim for Prince's rooms because I tuned rooms for his engineers, but personal rooms for them. But we could never get the schedule straight to tune Prince's rooms. Up, you know, up in Minnesota or where, wherever the heck they are, we we could just never coordinate the schedule. It was always, you know, Let last minute. Um, Any, but anyway, yeah. That, I mean, the guys have been working for him. I've I've worked with oh, cool. with a number of those guys. In order to, if we can leave here today, with the guys that watch the show, our buddies, having a, an appreciation of exactly what to do, a little of the philosophy of why to do it, and enough knowledge to kind of improvise a little, because it's not an exact science. You can't tell them, okay, go go get uh, 50 square feet of Owens Corning 703 and back it with a half-inch Luan board and use that green glue, you guys. You can't do that. It's just not possible, guys, so don't expect that. What we're going to try to do, hopefully, uh, with Bob's permission and support, is 
a, a little of the a little of the why you do things, and then he's going to get a little specific. But but um, it's going to take a little work on your part, a little more research. But we're going to try to give you all the information in, in in this hour that you can you can get started. And I think that's probably the most important thing that we can get you doing is just get started. Like when I'm working on my when I was working on my new room, just getting started made all the difference in the world. Now, now I move stuff around and I've moved my speakers around. Every time Drew comes by, I got my speakers in a different place. And and uh, is, is that true, Bob? Well, I'm going to say that 70% of what you can do for yourself is to find that one magic place in the room where the speakers and the listener want to be. There's really only one place in the room that's going to be the best. Is it normally two-thirds of the way from the back wall and a third away from the front wall? No, is, that, it doesn't, is that not it, true? It doesn't really have much to do with that. That's, the, that measurement is based on a modal assessment of a room, and the room has to be a perfect rectangle. There has to be perfect symmetry in the room. Mm -hmm. And actually, to tell you the truth, the, the, the model for doing modal analysis of a room is in a concrete bunker. So there can't be any windows or any lo base loss or anything like that, you know. So, yeah, I mean, it's an okay starting place, but it's, it's assuming that the speakers are in the wall. And, oh. and once you move the speakers out from the wall, which is what most home, home studios are, yeah. once you get them out and they start to interact with the boundaries, the modes go out the window. You know, they, they, they no longer become the most important thing. You taught me, um, and would this be a good thing to share with our audience, that the best thing to do is to get the room sounding good without EQ, and EQ is a last resort. Is that, is, am I repeating that accurately? That's correct, yeah. I mean, I ha kind of have a formula, which is, all my formulas are loose, because I don't believe in hard, hard anything, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, I mean, the laws of physics don't change, but, uh, you know, my formula is basically, you know, 70% speaker placement and listener placement, 25% acoustical treatment, and EQ 5%, that's the icing on the cake. You know, there certainly are cases where an equalizer can uh, address low frequency problems that otherwise would be too costly to do or you don't have enough space to really address the low frequency problems, uh, equalizers then can take more of that percentage and, in fact, save your butt sometimes. The, in, guy, in listening, the, the guy listening at home probably has two questions. What would you consider um, too much equalization? I know you can't answer that, but just give me, just give me a stupid yeah. number. And then the other thing is, um, I forgot my other question, damn it. Well, let's take the first question, okay. and then you can think about it while you're not listening to my answer. Good uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, one, Bob. So, the, uh, I, generally, if I'm looking at a room, a frequency response in the room, I'm trying to do cut only equalization on that room. Oh. And some, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, Very that's my, first, my first take, is let's, let's try to get the gain structure set up properly so that then I can, I can just go and address some of the cuts that need to be done. When it comes to boosting, boosting is dangerous for a couple of different reasons. One is that... That was my question. Yeah, boosting is, is important because, or dangerous because every time you boost, you're taking headroom out of your system. So if you add 6 dB, of boost at a certain frequency, you're basically taking half the headroom at that frequency out. So you could drive your system into overload more easily. Um, I, I should know that, but it just doesn't dawn on you, does it? Yeah, and so, you know, so you don't want to try to fill in some kind of great big giant hole. If I mean, if a hole is more than 6 dB in a room, you really want to address it mm -hmm. acoustically if you possibly can. Um, oh, I remember my question. Okay, well, hang on just a second, so I can forget what I was going to say next. Did I interrupt you? I wasn't listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Last you want you want to you want to try to you know be really judicious when it comes to to boosting. The other problem with boosting is that if you've got a cancellation creating this hole, 
the more energy you boost into it, you know, you're basically yeah. putting that, in, in, uh, that information into the speaker. That's just going to increase the energy that's reflecting out of phase and canceling. So you just answered you, my question. So way. you've got this, you know, you've, it's, it's sort of a vicious circle. Mm -hmm. You know, you're fill, adding more and more EQ to fill this hole that's trying to suck more and more out of it. I mean, at some point, with, depending on the room, you might be able to overpower it, but then you've got no headroom in your system. So in terms of, like, say, uh, the average bedroom with an eight-foot ceiling, would you say the biggest problem to address tends to be low frequency cancellations which which affect your perception of the low frequencies in that room or high frequency uh, reflections which tends to be the biggest problem to solve and the most costly and which one would you try to address first if you were on a limited budget of say five hundred dollars well low frequency is really your ultimate problem um, that's the foundation that's you know, the hardest like, to control yeah right? it's the hardest to control the high frequency stuff is easy really easy to address so when I go into a room, the first thing I'm trying to do is, and the reason that moving the speakers is so important is because basically all the speakers are omnidirectional below 200 hertz, unless they're specifically designed to be cardioid woofers, and there's only a, <clears throat> excuse me, only a couple guys designing speakers like that. So, it, you know, it, it, there's not much sense That's talking about That's why you can it. just take a sub and put it anywhere, right? Well, well, yes and yes and <laughs> yeah. no. The subs are the subs are also uh, boundary dependent as well. So what we try to do that means in, they're in, affected by the walls, by the walls and the ceiling. In the floor, in the floor. Yeah. So so the best way that you can try to even out your bass response, like I said, is to move the speakers around and the listening position until the reflections coming off the front and back walls and the side walls and the ceiling sort of comb themselves into a fairly flat response. From your experience, when you say move the speakers, are we talking half an inch? Are we talking inches, feet? We're talking... Multiple feet. You know, four to six inches is going to... can show you a significant difference. Wow. Four to six inches can be a significant change, maybe even three, three inches. It really is dependent on the room boundaries that you begin with. You know how how big the room is. You so know, the larger rooms are easier. If I, if I'm jumping ahead, just just slow me down. But if if most of the problems that are difficult to solve are lower frequencies, then trying to solve problems in a room with foam type uh, treatment is pointless because because you have to have mass to absorb and control low frequencies. And foam is just the opposite. There's no mass. Well, a quarter wavelength of Explain yeah. what that is, a quarter okay. wavelength. All right, so your wavelength, let's say you've got, well, sound waves, okay? And every sound has a wavelength, you know. From, for example, like from DC 20 to cycles, light. for 20 cycles to develop, it takes about 30 feet, right? Yeah, the, uh, 100 foot, 100 hertz wavelength is 11 feet. Wow. Okay, so in order to absorb 100 hertz, Either you want a specially tuned membrane absorber, which exists, or you want like two that. and a half feet of, of trapping. You wow. know? And that's a lot of real estate. The, the yeah. membrane would be like what we saw on, uh, on the uh, Bruce Woodin episode, those round sound traps. Is, would that be an example of a membrane type absorber? Um, it, I'm not sure. Tube traps is what they're called. Oh, tube traps. Yeah. Um, they have. I'm not exactly sure what the physics of those, you know, the interior uh, design is. Um, the membrane absorbers typically that I'm used to seeing are like the RPG corner traps. They also make, you know, uh, just square boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, the tube traps have one side that's soft and one side that's more diffusive. So I, I'm not so, I don't think that those are actually membranes. I could be wrong about that. Am I that, forcing but... you to jump all around? Do you want to get into a little bit of the, of the, of the science behind all this? No, no, I, no, I think that we're all, everything's good information. I got so many questions yep. for you, I'm trying to pack it all in for free. No, you know? it's, all, it's all good, you know, because uh, it's an, that's an assumption. You know, I'm, I'm one of these guys that's, you know, I mean, like, I don't like the rules of thumb. 
you know, and one of the, while we happen to be on this topic of bases, we'll, we'll get to this point, but I want to talk to people about corner traps okay. at some point, too. You're the because, boss. You because take over. You've, I mean, you've pointed out something that's really good here. You've said, well, the foam is only, you know, one or two inches thick. Yeah, that stuff's good for high frequency absorption, for picking up your first order reflections, but it's not going to do diddly for your base problems. It's, no. it's effective down to like what, maybe 4K? Well, 3K? You're, you're looking at yeah, you're looking at quarter wavelength. So you know, uh, you know, a couple inches is yeah, eight, uh, four, four to eight K. You know, that's more effective and depends on the shape. In in the world of foam, you know, the way it's cut can help uh, can help make it um, more effective at lower frequencies. You know, like if you took if you take a four inch base trap, that's you know, only moderately effective at 100 hertz, and you take this four-inch piece of foam or Owens Corning 703, you know, which is a cheap alternative, mm -hmm. uh, and you stick it right against the wall, it's going to perform the way it was measured, you know, at the factory, basically, and it's going to be, you know, a, like I say, minimal absorption at, at 100. But if you take that foam and you give it an airspace and you move it out a couple of feet, all of a sudden, the wavelength has to go through this big piece of foam, hit the wall, come back through the air, hit the foam again, and come back out. And oh. so by creating an airspace behind your, your treatment, you, it, you, you can You just made everything more complicated for me now. But. You can affect lower frequencies, though. So. Okay. Well, it's my job to make your life complicated. I know, but... Uh why I, I should have known. I should have known that. That's that's a big piece of information, guys. That you need to. I'm here taking notes. I hope. I mean, look at this. So I hope you guys are taking notes too, because this is this is exactly what what I wanted. And you and I tend to have the same sort of need for the same sort of information. So, all right, Bob. I'm I'm gonna be quiet. Go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, at any rate. So I mean, back the original spot that we were in was this speaker placement thing. And really, that's what you're looking for. You want to find the best placement for your speakers in the room that give you the smoothest space response. And then it's easy to then least, it's I'm, easy I'm to find you. the I'm, first order reflections. I'm gonna stop you one time because you just hit a you just said something incredibly important. So the, moving the speakers around is best to, to to help with a lower frequency response as opposed to. To the high. So when you're moving your speakers, don't worry about the high frequencies, what they sound like. Focus on the low frequencies. Yeah, not at that time. Yeah, okay. really, every, all, all the measurement that I do, and, you know, I use measurement equipment yeah. because it's a lot faster than trying to use your ears. Well, you, you know, I notice you use it to get you to a point, and then you fine-tune it with your taste. Yeah, well, that's at the, yeah, that's way down the road, you all know, right. from, from starting with speaker placement. Yeah, that's, you know, that's further uh -huh. down the road. So, I I mean, like you. I said, you know, first speaker placement and listening placement, second acoustical treatments. But yeah, I'm really concerned with the low frequencies. Now, it's sometimes what happens is, uh, well, let me backtrack a second. I, I'm concerned with the low frequencies because they're the hardest to treat acoustically. And then the high frequencies are pretty easy to treat. You know, because those you can find the first order reflections, they're pretty simple and you've got enough space to absorb them. So, or diffuse them depending on what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Uh, so, yeah, every, everything with regards to your question, everything in the beginning is based on bass. Now, oh, okay. you can get your speakers in a place where the bass looks really great and your imaging is going to suck because you're, you know, you're not in an equilateral relationship with the speakers. Explain the equilateral okay. triangle. Well, and, I mean, generally when I set a room up, I want the distance between the two speakers, the distance between the left and right tweeters, to be fairly close to equal to the distance of one speaker to the listener. And I actually kind of like the listener to be seated inside. If you do a triangle, that would all be 60 degrees then. And, and actually, like, kind of like the person to be seated inside the, you know, that zone a little bit, because it, you don't want to be right there at the apex of where the speakers are aiming, because with most speakers, uh, what you're going to find is you're going to kind of clunk in and out of the center image. 
And you. as you move your head little bits, the, the, you're going to lose your imaging. So I, I kind of like to have the speakers focused and meeting behind your head at some point. And it depends on the room and the type of speaker and such. But, uh, you know, I don't want them canted and aimed directly at your ears. And I what about heights of the do. speakers? You try and keep them, you try and keep the tweeter at ear level, the bass at ear level? That depends on the phase measurement of the speaker itself. So What's that? some well what that means is that if you've got a two or a three way speaker, uh, you know, you got let's say woofer and tweeter, or you've got a woofer mid range and tweeter, the way the manufacturer designed the crossover and designed the cabinet everybody has a different philosophy on where the actual flattest phase of that speaker is. And that's what you want to be in the flattest phase point because then you won't get any moving cancellations at the crossover region. You know? Oh, I see. So from, you know, generally a speaker sits at a certain height, okay? Uh -huh. And if you change your distance, your relationship to those two components, the woofer and the tweeter, the as the distances change, the cro your your crossover relationships, phase relationships change, and so uh, so you can end up with some kind right, of cancellation. Right, I never thought about that. Okay, so some guys build their speakers, and and everything's based on right on the tweeter. Some guys build them, and everything's based on a distance like halfway between the tweeter and the woofer, and some you know in some cases. Uh, the woofer is the phase, best phase alignment, or the mid-range driver turns out to be the best phase alignment. And you'd have to contact the, the is manufacturer. That why, is that the know? reason why I like my NS10s laying down as opposed to vertical, you think? Or it has uh, nothing to do with that? It has nothing to do with that. I thought so. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Actually, any speaker that's laying down, it, it, you know, the, the concept of laying the NS10s down really developed uh, because the you know when the NS10s came into play, a lot of the s studios the way they were designed, you, nobody at that time put anything on top of the console, and if you stood a speaker up on the console, you block, you'd block the mains. You know, so I didn't know that. So the speakers originally, I mean, the speakers were designed to be standing up. That was that was the design of the speaker, but when you do stand them up in the studio, they get start to get pretty high. Yeah, they so, do. You know, so yeah. your best phase alignment at the crossover is laying down on the NS10, but that's only for one point at the console. Okay. As you start to move across the console, it's like if you had them vertically and you were standing up and sitting down. So as you start oh. to move across the console, now you're changing your time arrival between the woofer and the tweeter, and you're getting funny cancellations through the crossover. Let me ask you this. Is there... Is there like a minimum size room, like say eight by eight with a with an eight foot ceiling, that you just go look? Don't call me. Here's the name of five people. I ain't, I'm not going to torture myself. It's not possible. Is there is there a minimum size that that, that 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 people should just tune out, turn turn the computer off, and just go away because we can't okay. help them? Well, I I have to say that. I've tuned some really tiny little rooms you know, in the past. And if the guy who's working, generally those kinds of rooms have been for composers. Oh, okay. they, don't, they don't have to use a lot of volume. Yeah. And well, it's not just volume, but you know, when we get done, really, there's a sweet spot about the size of a watermelon. You know, I want a big sweet spot. I want you to be able to move, you know, two, three feet either side of the console. Oh. You know, um, I mean, it, that's not, of course, it doesn't work in, you know, 12 foot rooms, but, right. but um, yeah, I want to create as big a sweet spot, as, as consistent a working area across the console as I possibly can. I so that you're went down at this end, EQing something, you're basically hearing the way it's supposed to be and the same response as, as when you're sitting in the middle. That's, that's what we're shooting for. Well, the now, good, if, the if somebody can sit in one place and just work, mm -hmm. and he's not going to have other people in the room working with him and such, 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, you could still do so it. So there's but hope for all the guys with smaller the, rooms. Yeah, for smaller rooms. But you're going to basically know that you're going to have to be locked into one spot. That's okay. going to have to become your reference. Well, if you got you a know. small room, you can't put too many people in it anyway. That's true. The Unless no they need to take a allowed. shower or yeah. use the bathroom or toilet at the same time or something. Yeah. And I, I've got a couple of <laughs> <laughs> bathroom rooms. Yeah, yeah. A couple and guys. what about ceiling height? That's that's. Well, just houses as are typically eight-foot ceilings. They, you know, he, here's an interesting point on ceiling height. Um, I mean, yeah, houses typically have eight-foot rooms, but if you have a slant ceiling, okay, uh, the the spot that you want to set your speakers up, the wall you want to set your speakers up, is the wall where the ceiling is at the lowest. So that you want the ceiling, you want a decompression scenario. You know what's weird? That you're describing my, my little project studio, and I set it up at the high side of the ceiling, and it was horrible. And I, I, set the, I went to the other side of the room, and it was like, it's a really good sounding room now. Yeah, yeah. I wish I'd, I wish I'd asked well, you that Well, what happens is if, if, uh, if you're at the high side, the speakers are hitting the ceiling and bouncing back and causing comb filtering. You know, you're getting a reflection off the ceiling. Oh. If you sit at the low side, the ceiling's taking that reflection and sh throwing it to the back of the room, where then it hits yeah. the back wall and then it, maybe it'll hit the floor or by the time it get ba gets back to you. And it also allows you to do maybe some bass trapping in the, on the high side, you know, get, you know, capture some more space to capture some, some bass in the back. But you'd capture the bass at the ceiling rather than parallel to the wall. Yeah, right? I, I would try to because that that gives you the ability to uh, to utilize more airspace. So let's say, what would you guess? Help me, Herb. Like like, um, what would you guess? Like most of our audience, would, I'm guessing would probably be in a room with an, with an eight to nine foot ceiling. Yeah. Probably maybe fifteen by twelve maybe a little larger. Can, can you give them some specifics on what to try? Well, that, yeah, that's... Not what to do, what to try right. is what I'm saying. Well, um, the, I think the first thing you have to do uh, is... I mean, there's one thing that we haven't really discussed at all. Oh, let's here. do that first then. Well, it, which is symmetry, you know, which to me is like the most important thing ever in setting a room up because if you have good symmetry, which means that the speakers are the same distance from the front wall, and I know, know that sounds stupid, but, you know. Got to measure yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, but also the same distance from the side wall, and you don't pile all your gear up on one side of the room. Like I do. You, you know, <laughs> and, you know, because all that affects the way the base behaves in the room. Okay. And if you want to have good base imaging, or any kind of in imaging, you need the speakers to perform the same, to have basically the same frequency response. And so, so that's, you know, to me, that's sort of the, the real starting point. That's where symmetry. you... Symmetry. Yes, yeah, symmetry. Is, is that that, it, that will help you with your imaging, that will help you with their bass response, because if your two speakers have different bass response, they're going to cancel, you know, you're going to have cancellations in the center. It's, that makes sense. You know, you're, you're going to have different frequencies coming off the side walls because, you know, the speaker's not just bouncing off the wall that's adjacent to it, it's also bouncing off the opposing wall as well. You Technically, know? when you're trying to control low frequencies, the problem is the addition and cancellation of certain low frequencies based on reflections from the walls. Is yes, that, is that, that's why I'm saying 200 so, hertz and below these things are omnidirectional. So your speakers are not just shooting at you, they're hitting the front wall, they're hitting the side walls, they're going in the corner, they're hitting the ceiling, the floor. So all the boundaries, every, everybody's manufacturing speakers that are flat in an anechoic environment. You know, they put them in an anechoic chamber and they measure them and then they're, they're flat, which technically is the best you could, thing you could possibly do because who knows what environment the speakers are going into. Yeah. So that's the starting point. But as soon as you put them into a room, now you've got all this extra energy coming from all these surfaces. So you need to find that balance. Is that you know? why, is that why like, like, 
you know, I use the Ausbergers with two fifteens yeah. in all the studios that I, I and and uh, at Enterprise they had the exact same speakers but mounted on stands instead of soffit mounted in the wall, and that's the reason the soffit mounting works is because it it eliminates one fourth the back wall essentially from creating problems. That's in a, in a little room. Like say a room a little smaller than this, how do you how do you? Uh, it seems like that would be the first thing you need to address, right? Yeah. Well, how do you, how do, you do yeah, that? Yeah, in rooms like you were describing, yeah, by having the speaker in the wall, then you do eliminate one boundary, and you also get the benefit of of uh, loading the the base. You know, so that you can get more power out of the base. Because what does that, so describe loading? What well, that's where uh, it's a it's a mathematical formula. So you've got, you know, uh, half space loading and quarter space loading and three quarter space loading. So depending on what boundary this speaker is interacting with, you know, whether a speaker is inside of a wall or sitting in a corner, the the more boundaries around it, the more it's going to emphasize the low frequencies. Okay, that's why there's this rule of thumb that says, well, take your subwoofer and put it in a corner to get the most energy out of it. It's a mixed bag, you know. It's it's a mixed bag, but uh, but by putting you know, by putting the speaker into a wall, the woofers become more powerful because they're not they don't have any space to you know wrap around space air space around okay. them. So you get this this uh, half space loading for the for the woofers. So yeah, they get more powerful and the benefit of of taking one of the bounces out. In you know, and I have been in people's rooms where I've actually ended up putting the speakers right up against the wall because that's where I got in their room the best response. Wow. You know, rule that's of thumb radical. says yeah. Rule and here's another rule of thumb, which I don't believe in any rules of thumb. My belief system is based on whatever works. That's it. You know, yeah. whatever works. That's it. you know. If I get a good measurement out of a room, I don't care where the speakers are. You know, and and people go well. They're sitting against the front wall. They shouldn't really sound that good. And it's like then they sit down and listen. They go, wow, it really sounds good. Or gee, they're really wide. They seem a little too wide in this room. They sit down and listen. And go, yeah, but I can pick out. Every freaking image point in this mix, you know. So before before we go to questions, can can you just pretend like you've walked into the average bedroom mm -hmm. and get us started on how, like, as specific as you can. My audience likes as specific as we can. Okay. Without creating problems, like go by this, do this, do okay. this first. Okay. Okay. We we already got the speakers. We know we're gonna. Let's pretend like we, the best spot for the speakers is is close to one wall, and that's that work. Now, but they're still like say three feet behind the speakers. What yeah. what do we do now? Okay. Well, yeah. The, I mean, the number one thing to do is go in and don't get locked into any kind of belief system of, as to you need to develop the base. You need to throw the length of the room, you know, as opposed to the width of the room. Every room is going to ha be different based on its dimensions and its construction as well, and and especially the, the amount of windows. You know, sometimes you can utilize a room that's got all windows on one side by putting the speakers on that and letting that <laughs> letting the base go out the window. You know, <laughs> from the back of the speaker. Wow. So, so the first thing I would do is go into the room and I would try the speakers on the short wall and try them on the long, long wall. Or the long wall and the short wall, but try them on both walls and see if they sound better. You know, just kind of a feeling to start. And once you've done that, once you've said, "Yeah, you know, I think that the long wall, is, and that's which you know is the best for the speakers," which means you're showing throwing the shortest way across. Then what you wanted to start doing is kind of moving. It's 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 a circular process. I generally will stick a speaker in a you know in a spot and start kind of moving it around in a 
bit of a circle, taking it six inches in every direction and seeing if I can get uh, a little bit better response out of it. So I, my advantage is that you know, I have gear to do this. You know, most everybody else, unless you go buy some app for your iPhone, and even probably the most rudimentary, rudimentary measurement tool. Now, I've seen some pretty crazy little things on iPhones, mm -hmm. and uh, most of them I consider to be just toys. But at least you'd have some type of reference because it's it's so freaking hard to do by ear. I mean, it's really tough to do by ear. This part of it, but you know. Start just moving the speakers around and see if you can get a more cohesive bass response. And you're going to have to do the same thing with your listening position. I mean, you want to be in, dead in the center between the two, the left and right walls, whatever they may be. Mm -hmm. Then it's just a matter of front to back. And that's a uh, game you play with the speaker and the, and the listener, you know, moving things forward and back to kind of get that feeling of where's the bass give you the best response so let's say let's say you've done all that but you but you you're you're real shy on on everything below 200 seems to be canceling out and you got a little peak at 200 what do you do now you've moved the speakers everywhere you've got is the typical thing where you where you're sub shy and have a bump like at 2 or 3 or the opposite is it well you're... well so uh, i mean uh Generally, what happens is speakers don't seem to load. You know, you lose the low end like this. The speaker's designed to go down to 40 hertz, but it's only going down to 60. Something like that, generally, I'm able to bring, bring up that, the, the lower frequencies by moving the speakers closer to the wall. Once again, this is kind of, oh. it's not, it doesn't work for every room. It's based on dimensions, but... As, you know, if I'm going to make a general, vast generalization, which I don't like to do, I'm going to say if, you're, if the speakers are really rolled off, then try to get them closer to a boundary and reinforce those frequencies um, with the boundary. It, it seems like when I'm in mastering rooms, they do the opposite. It seems like most mastering rooms are away from the wall. Well, yeah, that's because they've found that spot where the speaker wants to be. Your, your best response, I mean, your best imaging front to back depth is going to be if you're away from a boundary but we're talking about a couple different things here you know i mean yeah okay. i mean the general rule of thumb off. is that you want your speakers the rule of thumb is two feet from any boundary you know that's a rule of thumb uh -huh. you know front wall side wall and it's an okay place to start but it doesn't work for every room okay. you know it doesn't work for every room just like you know we were talking about base traps earlier corner traps you know if you go to these guys that sell system you know room treatment systems almost everybody has a kit that includes corner traps the, from from the lowest guy in the garage to the most respected scientist you know based acoustics company they all have a kit that includes some kind of corner trap and sometimes the corner's the, a good place to trap the bass, but sometimes it's not. It's not, it's not always the place where you want to put a trap. Sometimes you wind up putting a trap there and you end up sucking out frequencies that you don't want to suck out, you know, it, because it's all so interactive. So, I, I, read one, I read on one, one website that if if you're having a problem in the in the low end and you want to absorb some of that low end take like um, a one inch piece of Owens Corning 703 glue it to like if you if you want if your if your frequencies are like 100 200 glue it to a, a quarter inch piece of plywood if in like lower half and then if it was really low three quarter inch and then create these boards that are like four foot by eight foot and then Get, get two hang or three them. of those and hang them, hang hang them, them. around. Yeah, it, it, is that's that, cre that's building. That's a homemade membrane absorber, basically. Okay, but but it, but for the guys on a budget, that that, that, that it sounded kind of crazy to me, but that works. Well, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, there's a couple of things you have to keep in mind that you have to be able to put that membrane at a point where the energy in the room is the highest in order to absorb it. How do you find that? 
it takes a long time. Oh. You know, I mean, without measurement gear, you're going to be moving this thing a foot at a time, trying to figure out where is this spot. You can't, you can't just take a, a, one of these things and stick it anywhere mm -hmm. in the room and expect it to work. Because if you're in a null, there's no energy for it to absorb. You know, so you have to find a point where the energy is at its peak to, to get rid is of it. Is it possible for me to sit in front of my speakers after having found the best spot for those? Drew's a pretty strong guy, and have him schlepping around a four foot by eight foot piece of plywood with Owens Corning 703 and me hear the differences immediately yeah. and find Yeah, you the almost spot? don't even need the 703 on it. The 703 will get rid of any high frequency stuff, but you know, it's really the movement of the, of the plywood you know, the free-hanging plywood that, and we do this, I mean, it, it, you know, a lot of the rooms like your room, okay, I, I'm not exactly sure what the base trap design is, but our general design is to create a sandwich where you might use, like, anywhere from 2-inch to 4-inch 703 glued to a sandwich of a soundboard, you know, that crumply, you know, they don't use it a lot in construction the anymore. The brown but one. The brown yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's, it's like so compressed. John's Manville. Mm. I forget the number, but yeah. yeah. At any rate, it's like it's called soundboard, and it's like it's like the, the stuff in drop ceilings, but all brown. Yeah, yeah. It, it's well similar to that. It's not quite as dense as as the ceiling tiles that you're talking oh, okay. about. The ones with the little holes in them. Yeah. Yeah, it's not quite as dense as that, okay. but similar, so that you get the waves passing through that. And it has a little bit of movement. I mean, the way the traps work is that they turn sound energy into heat by movement. You know, that's, that's how they absorb the frequency, okay. is they, they move a little bit, and then it cre transfers the energy. I got you. You know what? So, what? Oh, I'm sorry. Were you going to do it? No, no, no. <laughs> well, why don't we uh, bring in some of our audience questions and... Uh, get to the corner office. Drew, you got stuff over I'm gonna there? I'm going to split for a while. I'm going to go work on my room a little bit. You want me to hold some... some <laughs> Drew, you ready to, <laughs> yeah, ready to go? I learned, I learned more with Bob Hodas in how long we've been here, 46 minutes, mm -hmm. than I have cruising around the internet for a whole damn year. Stay, stay for another 15. We're going to learn some more stuff. Right. Drew, what you got over there? Got a question from Tiger Paws 1216 question. If your room is not properly treated acoustically, would monitoring at low levels be a good strategy or would you still be missing out on certain aspects of the mix? Oh, tiger paws. That's the yeah. great question. Great that question. That is really good. That's, that's really good. And it, you know, and it falls into the area of people saying that, well, I'm going to use, the room sucks so I'm going to use near field monitors as opposed to the main monitors mm -hmm. in the room. Mm -hmm. Everything is affected by the laws of physics. So, and all speaker manufacturers pretty much today build their speakers so that they're linear with respect to amplitude. In other words, if you listen to them at 100 dB, they should have still pretty much the same frequency response as if you listen to them at 70 dB. So, no. You know, the, the, you're still going to be, the, the speaker's still going to generate all the frequencies and they're still going to hit the boundaries. And, wow. they're, and you're still going to have, I, I, I would have not, issues. I would have not intuitively. I wouldn't have guessed that, but that's yeah. cool. Well, it's it's it, you know. I mean, it's your hearing changes more, you know, than that. I mean, the Fletcher Munson curve. You know, your hearing's most linear between 85 and 95 dB, and so and as you get lower in level, your the highs and lows roll off. So and I should be monitoring at 85 to 90? 85 to 95 is where your hearing's the most linear. So I suppose 241 is out of the question where I normally monitor? <laughs> well, it's just 1 dB too high. Okay. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Hit All me, right. Drew. Another question. Uh, See if you Alex, can do two in a row, Drew. <laughs> Alex P., are there any budget tools, hardware, software for uh, newbies like me to treat the room? Okay, good question. Great question. Yeah, good question. So let's talk about simplifying the speaker placement process. There's a company called RPG. Uh, they sell, uh, you know, acoustical treatments. And they also have a little program. I don't think it runs on a Mac, but it runs on PC, I know. And it's called Room Optimizer. And I think it's like 90 to 100 bucks. 
And if you've got a symmetrical room, this thing, this little, and I'm going to rule of thumb, you know, caveat here. You know, all these types of programs, remember, are based on concrete bunkers. But this room, I found, can get you within 80%. You know, it has an 80% success rate of getting you very close if you've got a, symmet a rectangular symmetrical room. Yeah, and uh, it's primarily and for speaker placement. It's primarily for speaker placement, but that's most of the equation there. Wow. But it also then will show you first-order reflection points, so you can go and treat those for, uh, you know, for your high-frequency issues. With foam or something. Yeah, with foam or Owens Corning or whatever it is that you want to use. So uh, it's... Uh, RPG Inc., which is INC dot com, and and go to their website and look for Room Optimizer. And you know what? And I want to find uh, I want to find a slide here and show you guys a, oh, a quick trick. Um, uh, let's see. And Alex, good job, Alex. Good job, Tiger. Uh, let me see if I can if I can find. You know, this. I like Alex because he had a real name. Uh, <laughs> if, if, As if opposed could, to Octomom, <laughs> Octomom. 926. I forgot Octomom. Well, I was going to say, if, if Will could find uh, slide um, 13. You're under pressure, Will. Okay. And Come that's, that's going to kind of show one of the tricks that I use. Okay. There uh, it is. And yeah. that, there, there, is, there it is. Okay. So what we're looking at is... Man, Will's the best. Above 400 hertz. This isn't good for low frequencies. Above 400 for hertz, sound and light, they basically follow the same rules of physics. You know, it's like billiards. It's simple geometry. So if you could go, go to tap plastics or something and buy yourself a plastic mirror, and the reason I say plastic is because if you drop the thing, it won't break. And, I, and I've dropped them. You know. And if you sit... In this is picture, that, the microphone, the, in this yeah. picture, a mic, there's a microphone. I know it looks kind of weird up there, but uh, there's a microphone sitting in the listening position, mm -hmm. okay? And the speaker actually is eight feet away from the, from the microphone. It looks okay. like it looks it's right weird, on top yeah. of it. Yeah, it's perspective. But so the speaker at the end of the microphone is actually eight feet away. Okay. Now, over on the right side... I've got a mirror, and you can see there's a picture of the reflection of the mirror, I mean, a reflection of the speaker in the mirror. So if you can see the face of that mirror, that, that speaker in your mirror, that's a first order reflection point. Wow. Okay. So, so cool. you can do that on the ceiling, you can do that on the side walls, mm. and you can know that if I put. So is that why you got, there, is that why you got those mirrors on your ceiling? <laughs> Never talk about that. Okay. <laughs> I had a bedroom like that one time <laughs> in Sausalito when I was working at the record plant. Oh wow. Yeah. Oh wow. wow that's, we that's, digress. That's genius. I yeah, love that. We digress. So that 400 hertz and above. So for high frequency first order reflections, absolutely, that's the cheapest thing that you can do. But with, like I said, this RPG program will also, if your speakers wind up being pretty much in that spot where they predict then the first order reflection points that they show you in the program also will be in, in about the same spot. Wow. So it's, you know, on many levels, an investment of a hundred bucks can buy you thousands and thousands of dollars worth of time and anxiety and, and you know, sound make, treatment. And all yeah, that. yeah, yeah. Well, you're going to still need some sound treatment, but, yeah. but you know, finding yeah, that one spot. Right. I mean, as you if you make your investment in this stuff, it's going to increase your art. You're going you're gonna to be able to work faster. You're going to have more confidence in what you're doing. That'll give you the ability to experiment a little bit as opposed to just trying to fix everything all the time and running out to your car and going to the boom box and doing all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So as you can create this great listening environment, mm -hmm. you're going to make, you're going to continue to increase your art, make better records. Absolutely. And I'm dating myself here, I guess. Right? <laughs> better files. <laughs> better files. <laughs> but, but and, and as you do that, then people will come to you. And if they come into your room and your room sounds good, they're going to want to come back. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Drew, hit me. Got time for one more? Sure. We got, um, got one from Matthew Pugh. 
Very important. What tips can Bob give for people mixing and recording vocals in the same room as far as main treatment vocal points? Mm. Doing recording and mixing. Mm. Don't spend a lot of time on that one, Bob, because that ain't possible. <laughs> yeah. I, I actually have a couple. It depends on the size, size of the room, but, you know, basically, I mean, God, there's these things that wrap around the back of the, I don't know the name of the company. Yeah, I know. I they make one of these. They're popular. You now. know, it, uh, uh, that seems to work for a number of my clients. You know, they kind of like that. They, what you want to, you don't want to, like, close them off in a completely dead space because then they sound like... Yeah. Their, their voice is being sucked out. So there's got to be this balance between absorption and diffusion. Right. You know. I've had good luck uh, setting a couple of little R tones. Uh, I think I did Peebo Bryson this way or uh, somebody recently. Peebo was like 25 years ago, but uh, if you listen to Peebo, remind me. But I took two R tones, put them right next to each other, and put them on a music stand that was flat. Mm -hmm. I had it loud enough for him to hear without headphones, and, and it didn't. I didn't get tape bleed, and I did kind of like what you're saying. I created a little tiny room within the room around mm -hmm. him, and we got good vocals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I it's mean, tough. Those tube trap guys you're talking about, they, you know, it's expensive, but they make, you know, this attack wall or something. You know, you, and you could, you could do that with product, or you could try building it at home. You yeah. know, and you wouldn't really need much in the way of materials yeah. you know but you like I said you want to kind of balance between soft and hard surfaces so that you don't suck the life out of out of the vocals gotcha. you know uh, what you did you know um, and Tom Fly used to do this a lot where people didn't want to wear headphones he put the speakers out of phase the, the little speakers out of phase, so that you wouldn't get any of the low frequencies oh, that's uh, a good idea. you know uh, uh, at the guy anyway I used to just put the singer out of phase. But. <laughs> Give us one more, Drew. Nice. Uh, EQ32, is a subwoofer too much for the average home studio, and how much dampening is necessary to control them the if you do have one? the best audience in the world. Yeah, I mean, man. Every one of these questions are like... Damn good question. Damn yeah. good question. Yeah, yeah. You know, because uh, we... I mean, I can spend two hours talking about subwoofers. Easy. Uh, subwoofers are great things because one of the things that we didn't hit on is that... You know, sometimes if you get your speakers in the spot where the bass is the best response, your imaging sucks. You know, it's not, it's not really good for working. Mm -hmm. So having a subwoofer allows you to put your speakers where they would image the best and then have the low frequencies handled by the sub. And the sub, you can be more flexible in the placement because, right. you know, you could, because sometimes... Now, subs are hard to place, and you want to make sure that they're, everything's really in phase at the crossover point. But I, I use subwoofers a lot, and you could, uh, even in, small, even in you know, a 12 by 15 room, it could buy you a lot. It could save your, wow. save your base response. A 12 by 15 room? Yeah, a little, even a little room. You could use a little sub, you know? I mean, generally, you're going to cross those things over, you know, between 80 oh, and 120. Oh, me, Drew, me, Drew. You want a question? Dan? Yeah. Uh, all right. Do rolled up duvets in the corner of your room act as good bass traps? What? What? I'm sorry? Do rolled up duvets in the corner of oh, your duvets. room? Oh, duvets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a sorry. comforter. Co comforter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rolled up in the corner of the room act as a bass Worked trap. Worked as a bass trap. Okay, so, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, they had four good ones anyway. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I mean, there's something to be said for that. I mean, I, I'm going to, you know, I, it, I guess it depends on what the stuffing of the duvet is. If it's down, then it's probably kind of similar to Owens Corning house, you know, R13 housing in, insulation. The pink which, stuff. We, yeah, the pink stuff, which is kind of got a center frequency somewhere around 250 hertz. That low? Yeah, yeah. Wow. I yeah, well, it's, I, I mean, know. it's four, four or five inches of, of insulation. You know, so yeah, it's, it's centered around 250 hertz. Um, I would have never thought it's, that. It, I guess years. if that's where your problem is, it's certainly not going to do anything for the low frequencies. Uh, it, and depending on the overall reverb time of your room, it may tone the room down a little bit. Mm -hmm. You know, the, that's the type of thing that you just have to experiment with. You know, it. it I you know, know, like I said, it, corner traps are funny dogs. You know, they. Your question. Um, my question, Bob, is, uh, and this is going to put you on the spot, and I apologize, but have, have you run across any speakers 
under, let's pick a number like under a thousand that you would say, um, once you get your, your room tuned pretty good, is there, is there, is there, like, I get a lot of questions about what speakers should I use, what speakers should I use. If you yeah. run across any, like, like I happen to like the, the Mackie HR 824s if you're on a budget. I happen to like uh, NS10s because you can find those used. But uh, there's a couple others. Some people like the Adams A7s. Some yeah. people like, uh, it doesn't have to be power, self-powered, because I know you experiment a lot with speakers and, yeah. and, and not just expensive ones. You've got a, is, there, is there a speaker you've run across? If I'm putting you on the spot, just say no, because that, that's a pretty tall order. And when I say good, what yeah. the hell does that mean? You know? Yeah, well, I, you know, well, let me just start by saying this, that my taste in speakers isn't necessarily your taste in exactly. speakers. Although you and I have something going. I don't know what it is, mm -hmm. but... We you know, when I tune life. your room and I tune it to where I think it sounds really good, you think it sounds really I know. good. Mm -hmm. So, so we have you know similar similar ideas. In the, I mean, my take so far in the thousand dollar range, mm -hmm. you know, plus or minus is these little Focal uh, Solo 6 speakers. Solo 6. Yeah, and then they've got some speakers that are a little lower uh, budget speakers at the CMS series. I, you know, I've been to their factory and I know that they are really, really quality conscious in the way they build their things. Yeah. And so, and I happen to like the solos, you know, and the CMS, they make a little sub that's surprisingly good. You know, Is that, that solo, is that the one Manny has in his room? Yes, Manny has the solos in his room, the solo sixes in his room. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I've got a pair, you know, I've got a pair. You know, it's, I mean, it's a tough price point. Um, you know, I always, what I was going to say is that I always tell people, well, pick three speakers. There's a Dynaudio BM6A, I think. Didn't, is, didn't, that, is, didn't, an, uh, is that still being made? Because that was I, a pretty darn good yeah. little speaker. My friend speaker. Craig Burbage is using those. He loves the Dynaudios. And I yeah. think uh, Phil Tan said he was using them, didn't yeah. he? I think Phil Tan said he was using a Dyn Audio. Yeah, that's, that's another inexpensive speaker that that has impressed me. Okay. You know, uh, so but I keep talking about. It. I think. Well, I'm not sure. Better. I'm not sure that. Uh, you know, I'm not out there. There's a lot of speakers out there, and I'm not. A lot. I've measured a lot, but I'm not pricing them typically, or you know. Mm -hmm. But I can say that the you know Focal the Dyn Audio both good companies and and have made products I've liked in the past so okay. no what I uh, no sorry no sorry no sorry no, no man I mean, I got, time but you know what it begs for I got all these questions know, and I've got, we got to wrap, right. but that means that he's got to come back can you come back maybe your next trip you come in you come into town about once a month maybe not this next one but the one after that give our guys yeah, a chance guys to, to destroy a couple of apartment buildings no, and then come back I mean, what was amazing you know, was the level of questions that we had it was just yeah. fantastic well, that's also a testament to drew oh absolutely good drew, job good, drew. good good, good but, selection you know when i teach this it's if i get invited to a college or something i, I mean this is usually a six hour day exactly. and sometimes a couple of them you why know, we got to I mean, have you back tough. it's tough it's too you did much an incredible information. Job to too much information. In. No, and, and I, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm not lying. I'm gonna go home and try everything you said. I'm gonna get the little program. Uh, are you coming by today, Drew? Yeah. Uh, Drew's gonna be working his butt off today. Carrying around you know memories and stuff. And even vision. better than Drew. No, than what you're about to, <laughs> than what you're about to do what? is. Pay me to come up to your place with no, my gear. I can't, there you go. <laughs> I can, the reason I can't have you come out because you're the coolest guy. You won't charge me, and then I'll feel bad. Oh, I just thought of something I want to oh, share with the audience. I, I don't want you to feel bad. I'll charge you. Okay. <laughs> One of the things about Bob Hodas, guys, and uh, uh, this is important enough for us to, to go a little over, even though the FCC will be on us, but we can, you can take care of the FCC. They're outside. Okay. They're outside right now. Take care of them, Drew. And edit, um, edit some of my spaces out. <laughs> When Bob tunes the room, and one of the reasons I like his room tuning so much, he'll he'll pl actually play 15 or 20 of his favorite songs, and it's not about he he, he probably he probably makes as many significant changes listening to music he understands and knows and has heard in so many places as he does with what his equipment tells him. So the reason I'm telling you this is is don't feel inadequate if you don't have 
$50,000 worth of equipment, $100,000 worth of equipment like Bob has, because all you got to do is play some songs you really know. If you feel good about what you're hearing, you're there. Uh, I, I did an Into the Lair early, 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 early on, and I showed you some of the songs that I use. Bob knows those songs intimately. I drive, I drive Bob crazy with the fix, uh, Teddy Riley, and I drive Bob crazy with all those songs because I know that's what I want to hear. So uh, we didn't go into that, Bob, but I wanted to point out that that's what I respect about you because you don't just take all the gear, measure it, and leave. You take all the gear, measure it, and then you listen to it in a real-world situation, and you make as many adjustments, it seems like, uh, by trusting your ears, and, and that's the art about what you do. And, 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 and if, if we leave you today with any one thing, is that there's as much experimenting in art as there is science in all of this. The guys that do it like Bob, they can get it done really quick because they've got experience, but they're still, even for Bob, they're still a little bit. Uh, and, and remember now, it's 70% speakers, 20%, 25% acoustics, and 5% and EQ. The acoustics room treatment, in Bob's opinion and experience, is only a fourth this thing with the speakers, I, I would have put it the other way around. I would have said 70% acoustics, 25%. So I'm going to really go get this little program, and I want you guys to do that, Bob, whatever you need to do. If you don't want to get the you. program, if you don't have 100 bucks, uh, don't get it. I'm going to go buy it. I'll try it out, and if I like it, then I'll tell you to go buy it. Now, let's, let's, you, have a, you don't have a flat ceiling, though. You don't have a perfect rectangle. Your room's not perfectly I've got rectangle. I've got a slant, slight slant, slant ceiling. ceiling. Might not work in your room. You know, you're going to have to play with it a little bit. You might okay. have to fudge it because, once again, all these things, modal predictions, uh, boundary analysis, all these, all this stuff yeah. is based on well, I'm guessing, flat yeah. walls, no angles, you know, perfectly. Put, hey, put the camera rectangle. on me, Will. I'm guessing if this is my room, we're looking down from the top on my room and say this, this, this represents my floor. If, if, if my room were had a flat ceiling, my speakers might be here, but because of the elevated ceiling getting higher this way, I'd probably adjust this way, right? Not adjust this way to compensate for the ceiling, right? Because this, this is contributing more low end yeah. to the front wall, so... I can't really tell you. You know, I mean, it depends on the overall shape of the room. I mean, the overall dimensions. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's, I got a way to squeeze it, in five more minutes. That's all I yeah, care about. Yeah, it's not. It's not a. I mean, it's not like I said. You know, not the, science. It's not that part. It, it there is science there, but once you put an angle in, uh, the boundary predictions change, and the way the sound bounces around changes. So okay. it has, you know, more has something to do with the height of your speakers. You know, everything becomes a factor at that height. point. I forgot about that. Let's thank our guest. What a great time. Bob, Let's shake hands again. Thank you so much, Thanks, Bob. Bob. Thank what you, a man. pleasure. I, hey, I, 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 I love, couldn't have, love I couldn't being have, invited. I couldn't have planned a more perfect uh, hour. This, I'm so excited about it. get to hang out with famous guys. Guys. So we get out of here. By the way. Uh, I get to hang out with famous guys. This uh, is <laughs> hang out with Drew. By the way, uh, our guys will flash up the page. Make sure you get to us. Twitter, Facebook. YouTube, you see it up on the screen. Um, your comments are most appreciated. Yeah, yeah. We're going to uh, wind stuff up. You can go to Bob's uh, website, which was flashed up under the screen. I think it's BobHodas.com. Yes. Correct. Uh, make sure you do that. H O D A S. It was up underneath the screen. Um, get your comments to us, Drew. Thank you. And thank you guys. Dave, let's wrap up and get out of here. Can Hi I, guys. I'm a, oh, excuse me. Oh, I was going to say, can I say, if you send people to my website, there's a, a tab at the top called Educational Resources. I think. Okay. And there's a few articles that I've written about room tuning and, and setting your room up. I've that read are, those. They're excellent. That are on there. And, excellent. And it's a new, it's, I'm just changing my website so it's new and more do-it-yourself kind of stuff is going to go up there in the next few months. Fantastic. So. Okay, guys, I'm going to leave you with this. And this, is, this is just as important as anything we've ever done. Uh, one of my assistants, A.J. Nunez, uh, put a wonderful post on, on my Facebook and uh, a real legend, a real important figure in the, in the music world passed this week, uh, Gil Scott Heron, um, S-C-O-T-T -T hyphen H-E-R-O-N. And the reason that Gil Scott was so important um, is I've always maintained that without a purpose, sometimes you might make purposeless music. It, it's good to have sometimes a purpose. I mean, uh, some of my favorite records are by people that have a purpose. And, and Gil Scott Heron had a purpose. He was a pioneer. If it weren't for him, there might not be rap. If it weren't for him, there might not be a lot of things. 
but uh, I saw him uh, before I started, before I became an engineer. I didn't know anything about South Africa. He sang a song called Johannesburg that just uh, changed my life. He has another one called The Revolution Will Be Televised. Do you remember that one, Herb, of course? Mm -hmm. But if you don't know him, out of respect, uh, go check him out, look him up, and um, he's going to be missed.